Hello, my name is Evan Morikawa. <clears throat> so it's Wednesday, November 30th, 2022. This is ChatGPT launch day. Okay, our launch rooms actually look a little bit more like this, but maybe we'll design towards Dali's ideal for GPT-5. So we're actually a bit split on what would happen. Some of us were a little nervous. You know, this would be the first time we are allowing free access to our models with no waitlist. And, you know, internally, ChatGPT had already felt fun. It might go viral. We also had a finite supply of GPUs. We might run out. We also had historically shied away from chat applications before. Even though this new model was safer and more aligned than anything we had before, and our safety systems are better, there was still a chance of abuse. <clears throat> you know, on the flip side, some of us weren't that concerned at all. You know, people could already talk to our models through the developer playground for free. Uh, most things don't go viral. Also, this, this wasn't GPT-4, the next version. At the time, it was just a fine tune of GPT-3.5, which had been out for months. And the research teams demonstrated a way safer model than we had before. And finally, there was going to be no press blitz, just a blog post and a tweet. What could go wrong? So one last load test. And the tweet goes out. Traffic slowly starts to rise in, and then plateaus. Uh, and actually plateaus below our expectations. In fact, we congratulate ourselves for keeping the lights on on that Wednesday. You know, we never even passed number five on Hacker News that day. Internally, we called this our low-key research preview, which is now a bit of an infamous term. Uh, and on launch day, it actually did indeed seem to be a relatively low-key research preview. So we all get to go to sleep on the evening of November 30th. At 4 a.m. the next morning, December 1st, on call gets paged. <laughs> For some reason, Japan is hammering us. Is this, is this a DDoS? It's not. It's real traffic. Japan had just woken up first, and now it's spreading through Twitter. Oh no, an Elon tweet. <laughs> so, okay, we had a contingency here. The idea was that much like a bouncer at a club, once we hit capacity, we wouldn't let any new people sign up until some left. The thinking was that it would actually net give more people a chance to experience this than a traditional sign-up wait list. Internally, though, we called this our fail whale. <laughs> and we were at capacity and the fail whale was going up, and there was no more cavalry with GPUs. Uh, this we're at capacity page was actually shown quite a lot in the early days. Uh, and actually props to our team for doing the best they could to kind of keep it light. By the way, this page was literally true. We had no more capacity to serve ChatGPT and no easy way to get more. I actually talk a lot about more of that later. So traffic continued to rise faster and faster. And for the next several months, the team was nonstop trying to stabilize this very nascent system and keep up with demand. Now, there are a lot of stories and a lot of lessons learned from this journey. But from all of that, I'm actually just going to focus on three today. One, GPUs and the quirks of running these large language models at scale. Two setting up a team to grow while staying nimble at the same time, and three, responding to lots of anticipated abuse and some safety challenges we had as well. <clears throat> Let me also start by briefly introducing who I am. So I do not have a PhD in machine learning. My, my background is in engineering and product and startups. I joined OpenAI about three years ago when we started an applied team. Uh, now, the applied team at OpenAI is broadly responsible for safely bringing this crazy technology to the world. It's, it's the engineering product and design behind the API, ChatGPT, and whatever comes next. Um, and when ChatGPT was launched, I was managing our applied engineering team. This is why the lessons learned that I talk about here today are less about deep AI research ones, but more challenges in engineering and organization and product. <clears throat> So first, I want to talk about GPUs and how ChatGPT gets the most out of them. So GPUs are the lifeblood of ChatGPT and the APIs that it's built on. 
the extremely finite supply of these things, their quirks and cost dominate how we operate and scale. So to set the stage of this, let me start by introducing you to the actual GPUs that we use. This is the computer powering ChatGPT, well, a lot of them. Um, and inside of there are eight of these A100 GPUs. They have this special HBM, high bandwidth memory, attached to each GPU. <clears throat> and critically, we need all the GPUs to talk to each other as well. Uh, we have this special interconnect we use through NVIDIA called NVLink uh, that has their own switches on the board. And it also is connected to the outside world through both Ethernet and InfiniBand, which can give us 200 and soon 400 gigabits of network for each and every single one of those cards. <clears throat> and I'll talk a lot about this and the specs of these today because for us and these types of models, every single bit of added compute or bandwidth directly impacts the ChatGPT user experience and what we can offer. <clears throat> So there are a lot of things to talk about GPUs. I mean, it's, it's a whole field, but today I just want to focus on a few. One is GPU RAM and KV cache, batch size, ops to bytes, and arithmetic intensity, scheduling, and auto-scaling, or the lack thereof. Um, now, don't worry, I actually will explain, you're not expected to know what all of those mean. I'm going to go into it a little bit, but uh, getting an understanding of these was really critical for us as we scale ChatGPT, and kind of a lesson about the depth that's needed to make this happen here. So in order to better introduce some of these topics, let me give a quick intro or refresher into how these AI models work at all. So when you ask ChatGPT a question, we take your text, chunk it into tokens, turn each token into a vector of numbers, then just multiply that through hundreds of billions of model weights, which are gradually tuned through gradient descent by predicting the next word for all words on the internet. We then take the odds of the next most likely token uh, and <clears throat> repeatedly, token by token, word for word, ChatGPT will eventually spit out your conference talk. Um, in this architecture, <laughs> Each token is also aware of every single other token, uh, and this is known as self-attention. And the longer your text or context, the more math you need to do. Uh, unfortunately, self-attention scales quadratically. The longer your text, quadratically, the more math you have to do. And additionally, there are all these expensive projections that you need to, to map things across dimensions. So there are initially sounds bad, but there are a couple relevant properties here. First, you can cache the math you did on all prior tokens. This is known as a KV cache. Um, so KV refers to these three major named matrices that are used in the attention mechanism. The third Q, which you might hear, it actually changes every time and can't be, be cached. So it's really just about the, the name for the eternals here. Um, <clears throat> Kind of the key thing, though, is that you have to store this cache in GPU RAM, in this very special HBM3 memory we have, because pushing data across a PCIe bus is actually two orders of magnitude slower than the three terabytes a second I get from this memory. Uh, as you imagine that matters a lot. And it's so fast because it is physically bonded to the GPUs in stacked layers with thousands of via pins for massively parallel data throughput. Um, now this GPU HBM memory is very expensive and quite limited, and most of it is also spent storing model weights. So like any cache, we expire once this fills up, oldest first. And if we have a cache miss, we need to recompute your whole chat GPT conversation again. And since we share GPU RAM across all the different users, it's possible your conversation can get evicted if it goes idle for too long. Now, this has a couple implications. One is that GPU RAM is actually one of our most valuable commodities. It's frequently the bottleneck, not necessarily compute. And two, cache misses have this weird, massive, nonlinear effect into how much work the GPUs are doing because we suddenly need to start recomputing all this stuff. 
And this means when scaling ChatGPT, there wasn't some simple CPU utilization metric to look at. We had to look at this KV cache utilization and maximize all the GPU RAM that we had. A second metric was this was batch size. <clears throat> um, now, batch size is roughly the number of concurrent requests we run to the GPU at the same time. And in an H100 GPU, every second we can move, at most, 3.35 terabytes of RAM in and out of memory registers. And in that same second, we can multiply 1.98 quadrillion 8-bit floating point numbers. This means that it, it can do 591 floating point operations in the time it takes to move one byte. In the industry, this is known as a 591 to one ops to byte ratio. So in other words, if you're going to spend the time moving an entire gigabyte around, you should do at least 591 billion floating point operations. And if you don't, you're just wasting GPU and potential compute. But if you do more than that, you're just waiting around on memory bandwidth to get your data in there. And in our models, the amount of memory we need to move around is relatively fixed. It's roughly the size of our model weights, which means that we do have some control over how, on how much math that we can do by changing our batch size. So as a result, when scaling ChatGPT, we also needed to monitor this batch size to ensure the GPUs were fully saturated. So overall, it is this combination of batch size and KV casualization that turned out to be the primary metric that we used to determine how loaded our servers were. Um, and this, this took a little while for us to arrive at ourselves. We started with a simpler GPU utilization metric, similar to standard CPU utilization metrics that we use today, but this turned out to be misleading. Simple utilization only told us whether or not the GPUs were doing math at all in some time period, not if we had saturated this arithmetic intensity or we're running out of KV cache. And while here I'm only talking about KV cache and batch size, in reality we've discovered that bottlenecks can arise from everywhere from memory bandwidth, network bandwidth between GPUs, between nodes and other areas. And furthermore, the location of those bottlenecks will change dramatically on the model size, architecture, and usage patterns. For example, asking ChatGPT to summarize an essay has vastly different performance characteristics than asking it to write one. Now, the variability here has actually made it very hard for us and chip manufacturers to design chips to get that balance just right. For example, while the next generation H100 increased flops of compute by 6x over the A100, memory bandwidth only increased by 2x. And we and other large language model companies are discovering how easily we can get memory bound which actually kind of limits the value of the gains of these new GPUs. Uh, and NVIDIA kind of had no way of knowing this themselves since the H100 designs got locked in years ago and future ML architectures and sizes have been very difficult for us and anybody to predict. But overall, we just like constantly need to be tweaking this math as the models in, uh, evolve. All right, so a third challenge I wanted to talk about GPUs was just finding them. <laughs> Um, we and AI in general have grown much faster than NVIDIA or the whole TSMC supply chain can produce these. Um, <clears throat> and with a supply chain as complex as semiconductors and data centers, bottlenecks have come from all sorts of different places. So one way out of this was to just take GPUs wherever we could get them. And it so happened that geography was an alleviating factor kind of just due to the whims of data center space. And as a result, we quickly found ourselves in many regions all over the world. Note that this is actually a map of just the all Azure public regions. So we do deploy with Microsoft Azure, but only in some of the regions you see here. Um, but it has forced us to get really good with Terraform and cluster management to spin up and manage all of this. You know, going multi-region and multi-cluster from day one was challenging, but unfortunately necessary because of the GPU crunch. Um, also, for us, I should note that the time of a response is dominated by the GPUs streaming out one token at a time. As a result, it's been more important to just get capacity and optimize the well-balanced fleet over, say, putting things geographically close to users for round-trip time-of-flight reasons. 
Um, and a final and dominant challenge has been just an inability to scale up this fleet. That, right? There, there are no more GPUs to auto scale into. It means when ChatGPT showed its we are at capacity page, that that was true. Like there was no, we couldn't scale up manually, let alone automatically. Um, <clears throat> it's also meant that we've actually had to delay certain launches and product features as a result of not having enough GPU capacity. I think it's underappreciated that the kind of growth that ChatGPT saw could have been even bigger and faster if we weren't actively limiting usage due to a finite supply of GPUs. So in solving all these GPU challenges, I think we've learned several kind of key lessons here. First is how important it is to treat this as a systems engineering challenge as opposed to a pure research project. Our ability to optimize KV cache and global data center strategy and product needs has been important. The team's ability to jump across the stack is really important. Second is how important it is to adaptively factor in the constraints of these systems. You know, before OpenAI, I was used to watching just 80% CPU utilization metrics, auto scaling into an infinitely big cloud and prioritizing edge computing. None of that applied here. Furthermore, <clears throat> every time model architecture shifts, a new inference idea is proposed or a product decision change you, uh, changes, we need to adapt and rerun a lot of this math again. And finally, and third is diving really deep here has been important. For us, the lowest level of implementation details matter. For as much as I'd like to think of this as a black box that takes text in and spits slightly smarter text out the other side, in reality, the more people that dove really deep into the details of the box, the better we became. Uh, you know, and these problems will only get bigger with GPT-5 and browsing and fine tuning, code execution, the next order of magnitude is so scale. Um, but even though I talk about these in the context of chat GPT, I expect they'll definitely hold going forward as well. So the second kind of major challenge area I wanted to talk about was growing a team while trying to stay nimble and ship quickly at the same time. So when chat GPT launched, the entirety of applied engineering was about 30, including me. Uh, it's now almost about 100, 10 months later. Um, and, you know, OpenAI has actually always had a pretty strong tension with headcount growth. Sam Altman, our, our CEO, has a great belief in high talent density and keeping what you can do with as small of a team as possible. And as a result, we've been trying to stay small as long as possible to, like, really maintain that iterative, scrappy, kind of get-stuff-done culture. But, you know, at the same time as the product scales, I'm reminded of the acuteness of our needs. What might be departments of hundreds elsewhere is currently being propped up by just a couple people um, at any given time, some of whom might be on vacation. Um, I think one of the most impactful things we've done is actually structuring ourselves up to capture the essence of those earliest days of a highly integrated, fast-moving startup. Um, ChatGPT, the, the team and the app, looks, feels, and acts like a 10-month-old startup. When ChatGPT was getting started, you know, we made the conscious choice to give it a fresh repo, fresh cluster, lightweight security controls. We also made sure to have the corresponding research teams tightly integrated with the product development cycle. For us, it was DERP, design, engineering, research, and product, all in one group. Now, the rhythm of the team, the state of processes, communication overhead, and level of responsibility in each person much more closely match what you would expect from the first year of a startup. Uh, also, we're, we're a little bit different in that I additionally think, in our case, the fact that we had everybody fully co-located in an office did actually kind of help in this sort of messy early forming periods here. Um, so it turns out ChatGPT is actually not the first time we've used this pattern. When the applied team started about three years ago with the API, we did something similar. So whereas ChatGPT feels like a 10-month-old startup, embedded within a three-year-old startup that is applied in the API, embedded in this eight-year-old research lab that is OpenAI. Um, and I expect us to try and continue this kind of fractal startup pattern as whole new product categories emerge going forward. Now, this strategy does have several challenges to succeed. We accepted a little bit of tech debt and duplication in our tech stacks, and, and now are starting to invest more in these pan-engineering platform teams to get ahead of some of this. We've heavily skewed buy over build. 
you know, or push for a small team, like w wanted to leverage that as much as possible. But we're also starting to hit scales and types of um, issues and security concerns that are, will need much more tailored and efficient solutions. Uh, and in order, we really also took an egoless team and a very strong mission to help keep everybody aligned in the same direction here. Here, actually, OpenAI's overriding mission to achieve a safe and aligned AGI has balanced a lot of competing visions. We've literally asked ourselves, does this get you closer to a safe and aligned AGI to help guide things moving forward? You know, at the same time, though, the advantages of this smaller startup-like environment, I think, are immense. It's easier to just get things done when the ownership is high and interdependencies and processes are low. It's easier to keep a scrappier environment in a fresh startup. Our iteration cycle can be extremely short. Also, in this field, product problems are intimately link linked to research problems. And the takeaway here might be to like really introspect what are the aspects of a startup that can make them feel nimble and see how those can be incorporated structurally. It doesn't come for free, but we think the trade-offs are worth it when this nimbleness is one of the key advantages that we have. So the third and final major challenge I wanted to talk about is some surprises we had when dealing with abuse on the system, as well as a look into some upcoming AI safety challenges we will face. So at OpenAI, AI safety and abuse of our APIs and products are inexorably linked. It's in our core mission to prevent AI from powering mass disinformation campaigns, amplifying the worst parts of the internet, or causing other forms of harm. And ensuring proper safety mitigations are in place have been the primary blocker actually for launches and things like that. So despite our efforts here, few areas adapt quite as quickly as people attempting to abuse your systems. And this is especially true if there are financial incentives too. For one final story, I wanted to tell you about a group who started to reverse engineer some ChatGPT APIs and what we did about it. So an engineer discovered traffic on our endpoints that didn't quite match the signature of our standard client. You know, at the time, ChatGPT, the app, was privileged in a normal way that API traffic wasn't. And as such, abusers getting access through ChatGPT could do more than the normal API. And if we flat out blocked those attackers, they'd immediately know and adapt. So a member of the team had an idea. <laughs> this was immediately implemented. <laughs> Uh, and voila. <laughs> so it turns out our security team had been proactively monitoring these abusers. They had already joined the Discord community where it was happening. As a result, we got this rare opportunity to watch this from the other side. <laughs> uh, and the attackers quickly noticed something is off. Uh, their bootleg API no longer made <laughs> any sense. Uh, Another example, you know, they quickly put it together. <laughs> Not only did they quickly put it together, they even gave us a suggestion for next time. <laughs> next time. <laughs> so <laughs> over time, we've discovered actually more people that have been attempting to exploit the API. They're not quite as good as, as cat GPT. <laughs> Um, so, so while CAT GPT may be a fun example from today, you know, as the models become more powerful and the harm they can do in the wrong hands becomes even greater, our vi vigilance here does need to increase exponentially. That being said, we know it's impossible for only us and our researchers and our red teamers to identify all possible avenues of abuse and misuse. This is actually why we believe gradual controlled contact with the real world has been one of the most important ways to identify and fix safety concerns. Iterating early and often with real users is extremely familiar to people building products and is a philosophy that we use today with ChatGPT. Now, I should note that ChatGPT going out to everyone at once was only possible because we had spent years getting comfortable with the models in a more controlled setting. Newer, riskier products going We'll, we'll go through several stages of rollout as we identify and mitigate risks. Additionally, we also believe that we'll need to adapt to this strategy as the stakes get higher. Boeing doesn't ship like Facebook for a reason. And our concerns of today will look very different than those of tomorrow. So ChatGPT's story is just getting started, and I expect all of the three challenges I talked about today will persist in new forms going forward. 
And while GPUs may start to become more plentiful as supply chains catch up, the need to utilize them ever more efficiently will grow as they consume larger and larger budgets. GPT-5, 5 tuning, and a myriad of yet-to-be-released products will stress this compute. Uh, and hopefully you can see that this type of layer has different scaling considerations to keep in mind. You know, this GPU RAM and high bandwidth interconnects are just as important as how many numbers you can multiply in a given second. Keeping the essence of a startup in this team is one of the only ways we've been using to stay nimble. It comes with trade-offs, but can be repeated more than once. And it will get harder as we grow and will change as, uh, challenge us to culturally keep that spirit going. And finally, there are always unexpected challenges at our doorstep, uh, particularly from abusers who are sophisticated. Uh, and while not always a fun time, sometimes you can make the most out of any situation. Uh, so while mentioned cat GPT can alleviate the abusers of yesterday, the future abuse, safety, and alignment challenges are going to be a lot harder. And if those become harder, we'll need to invest more. Um, but then the, the safety mission is so core, though, that we will, this will be like a continued area of focus uh, going forward. Now, there are many more behind-the-scenes stories for ChatGPT, at least as many as there are people who helped make this possible. I wanted to acknowledge, though, that even a small subset of these stories represents the work of dozens of people, only part of whom are represented here in our commemorative Snuggies. I, I just had the honor of sharing all of their work with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you.